And I'm pressing record. I am recording here. Okay. Your hair looks really good. Does it? I brushed it. <laughs> I washed mine. <laughs> you look lovely too. Oh, thank you. Hello, and welcome to Book Dreams, the podcast for everyone who loves books and has ever wondered about them. I'm Julie Sternberg, author of a number of children's books, including Like Pickle Juice on a Cookie and its sequels, and the Top Secret Diary of Celie Valentine series. And I'm Eve Yohalem. I'm also a children's book author. My books include The Truth According to Blue and Cast Off, The Strange Adventures of Petra de Winter and Brom Broen. In each episode of this podcast, we consider a book-related question, and in this episode, we explore bookmobiles, or more precisely, bookmobiles, what's it like to have one? What's it like to run one? (laughs) Yes. So Eve, I have a clear memory of the first time that you and I discussed a bookmobile. I wonder whether- I do not. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So in my memory, it's the very early days of the podcast. So we've been friends for a long time, but we haven't worked together long. And we're sitting in your kitchen, and I say, I want to talk about whether we should buy and run a bookmobile together. Oh, and now I remember that vividly. (laughs) And you looked at me like, oh my God, what have I gotten into? (laughs) Well, well, you used the word buy, and my first thought was, doesn't that cost lottery winnings of money to buy a book? I just had no idea what the parameters were. Right. I like how you dream big. This seemed to me actually kind of small compared to what I had already been trying to get you to do, which was to buy and run a bookstore with me. I do also remember you're coming back to me. I don't know. I feel like it was just a couple of meetings later and saying, you know, that bookmobile thing that you mentioned? Actually, I I think it's kind of an intriguing idea. I also remember you texting me pictures of bookmobiles. And then I did start thinking about it. And I thought, well, this would be so great because in New York City, the big obstacle is rent. But if you have a bookmobile, you have no rent. And so I started thinking, well, maybe this is actually the better idea. Right. Um, So all we've done so far, which is very fun, is follow up on this idea by talking to various folks who run bookmobiles. We spoke to both Hannah Spratt and Michelle Fernandez, who are librarians with the Bronx Bookmobile at the New York Public Library, and Kevin Foster, who's the bookmobile manager at Parnassus Books in Nashville, which is a bookstore co-owned by author Ann Patchett and by Karen Hayes. We started by talking to Hannah and Michelle. They told us a little bit about the history of the New York Public Library's bookmobile. Blew me away to find out that the New York Public Library has had bookmobiles since the 1930s. And I'm really regretting that I didn't think to ask at the time, were the original bookmobiles horse and carts. I mean, I know they had cars and trucks in the 30s, but there were still horse and carts for things. In my imagination, the bookmobile in the 1930s was horse and cart. I'm just putting that out there. So the New York City Public Library had bookmobiles all the way up until the 80s. And then they stopped them because by the 1980s, there were so many branches of public libraries that they didn't need them anymore. Cut to 2019 and many of these branches are really old. And so they brought back the bookmobiles to take the place of branches that have to close temporarily because of renovations. And so today, the New York Public Library has one bookmobile for each borough that they serve. So Hannah and Michelle staff the bookmobile for the New York Public Library in the Bronx five days a week. Julie, would you like to describe the Bronx Bookmobile for the New York Public Library? I would. It's so fun. It's about 20 feet long. It's like a sprinter van. It's bright red, and it has the New York Public Library lions painted on it, that logo. And it's kind of reminiscent of a food cart because they have a big service window. So people don't come inside the Bookmobile. They keep about a 1,000 books inside, and they have book carts, which they bring out to the sidewalks, and then readers stop by, and it's so fun. So here's what Michelle had to say about how they serve community members. We can see somebody walking by on the street one day who comes up to us and asks us, oh, do you have books on Islam? And we can say, you know, not at the moment, 
but come back. We'll be here tomorrow or the next day and we give them our schedule and then we can go back to the library. We have the circulating collection of the New York Public Library at our disposal and we can just run up and grab a bunch of books that we think that person would like and just bring them the next time. Are you getting to know people in the neighborhood through their reading likes and dislikes? Yes. We have some regulars and then a decent amount of our interactions are just purely serendipitous. Do you think the bookmobile might draw more people in a strange way than if you had a big building? Yes, definitely. The bookmobile, it's visually striking. It's unusual to see. We get different reactions from across age groups. Um, Because very often an adult will see the bookmobile and it will immediately transport them back to childhood. Mm -hmm. And they remember the school bus that would come up and they would be able to board and browse the books. And they'll just come and talk to us about their memories of the library. And some children have absolutely no idea where we came from or what we do. And it's just so exciting and so fun to interact with them as well. Hannah, Can you say a little bit about how you choose which books go on the bookmobile shelves on any given day? Sure. So we try to have a pretty general browsing collection. Most people aren't planning to come to the bookmobile. They see us out and about. We want stuff that catches people's eye. And like that's one book that I'm inspired because I saw it here today. I'm going to take it with me home right now. We try to get new popular titles, classics, things that people are going to be familiar with. But we also look at the communities that we're serving. Are there schools in the area? Do we want to have more juvenile? Um, But if we know we're going to a community where we have a lot of Spanish speakers, we might beef up our Spanish collection a little bit or make sure that we have more of those books on the van to pull out when somebody stops by and doesn't see quite what they want displayed. Are people eager to see you? I mean, do you feel like, and maybe you can't quite compete with the ice cream truck, but you know, do you, <laughs> is there any kind of joyful reception when you're driving around? Absolutely. Yeah. We have jokes that it would be cool if we had a jingle, but yeah, definitely we get recognized and we get waved. And It sounds really fun. So I'm curious, I'd love to know from both of you, but maybe we'll start with Hannah. How does this work compare with the work that you do or that you've done in a regular library? And what do you like most and least about the bookmobile? I would say one of the big differences just in terms of like the day-to-day stuff is that the bookmobile is a lot more um, physical than being in a branch, moving four book carts on and off the bookmobile, as well as a couple folding chairs, a table if we're doing a display that day. I really enjoy that part of the job. We get a new scenery, we get a new setup. That's really fun, but it is very different than showing up at a physical branch, having your collection ready to go and waiting for people to come to you. A challenge is uh, the weather. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. If, it's, if there's too much rain, we're, we're out of there. Mm. And how about you, Michelle? How does this compare with the work you've done in a regular library? I would say the big difference is how much more forward-facing we are. Obviously, you do interact with the public if you work in a brick-and-mortar branch, but those people are walking into the library for a specific purpose. They already came to you. We are going out into the community. A lot of what we do is sort of being salespeople and having to explain to people the value of what we do. A lot of times we do get people who say, you know, oh, well, well, I don't read. Okay, that's fine. Not everybody does read. Mm -hmm. But do you like podcasts? If you like podcasts, you might love audiobooks. Ah. And if so, did you know that you can download free audiobooks from the library with your library card? Or maybe none of that, but would you like to take your children to the museum? With your library card, you have access to countless museums across New York City for free through the Culture Pass program. Michelle, can you talk generally about whether there are particular kinds of events that the Bookmobile has done, kind of special events aside from its usual operation? Yeah, so we do visit community events such as festivals. We do school visits. Prior to um, COVID, we had a partner with um, the Andrew Jackson Senior Center and another community organization where one day a week we would bring the book cards into their lobbies 
and set up for five, six hours. Our intent really is to reach the seniors where they're at, people who might not be able to make it to a physical library location. So on those days, you know, we load up extra large print books and we wheel those in and we get people there um, with some mobility issues who really take advantage of the holds and us bringing them the materials that they need. This might be a really boring question, but I'm curious about, are there practical considerations? Are there permitting issues and parking issues? What are some of the challenges, logistical challenges? We have city plates, which allows us a little bit of flexibility with parking, which is a huge, huge consideration, Mm -hmm. as you might expect in New York City. We do all of the practical stuff, vehicle maintenance and pumping gas and anything that you would expect really with running the vehicle. Something you might not consider is um, because we are a sprinter van, we don't actually have a bathroom with us. So that is something we have to consider um, (laughs) when we pick our locations because we're there for, you know, five, six, seven hours. Um, Yeah. Now we're really getting a peek behind the curtain. (laughs) Well, no, because I mean, you do have to think that you're out for seven hours a day. You have to plan your meals. Where are you going to get your coffee? Those are all definitely considerations. Okay, the bathroom thing is a problem. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's I didn't true. think about that's the true. bathroom issue <laughs> when I was fantasizing about the bookmobile. Well, while we're fantasizing, while we're designing our perfect bookmobile, we'll have to keep that in mind. Yes, because I do think Michelle and Hannah have something of a dream job running this bookmobile. But it doesn't sound to me like you and I could do this. For one, we don't have masters in library science, so the New York Public Library isn't going to give us a bookmobile. And then they also have these wonderful librarians like Hannah and Michelle, so they don't need us to run their bookmobile. (laughs) So if we're going to do this bookmobile thing, I think it's going to have to be more along the lines of what Kevin does for Parnassus Books. Right. So it's a good thing we spoke to Kevin all about what it's like to own a bookmobile unconnected to the library. So with Kevin, we got down to brass tacks very early, and here's what he said. The bookmobile is named Peggy, right? Yes, short for Pegasus, the famed winged horse. (laughs) Can you paint a picture of her for us? Sure. So she is bright blue. (laughs) That's probably the most notable thing. In fact, I've heard kids say it's the big blue book bus. So (laughs) we're known in a lot of different ways. But yeah, so it's kind of like a neon blue 27 foot long bus from the early 90s. It has sort of a swooping Pegasus logo on the side, says Parnassus on wheels. And if you go inside, there are shelves on both sides. And at the front where the driver sits, the chair swivels to face like a little countertop. And that's where people check out. The space is, is it's small, but it's maximized as far as getting books in there. And I think typically we have around 2,000 units on the bookmobile. So that's surprising. How many people can fit there at one time? It definitely depends. We push the limits pretty frequently. If adults are on the bus and they want to be comfortable browsing, eight to 10, I would say. But we do a lot of school events and I've had entire classrooms of 25 or 30 kids on the bus, which is absolutely too many. (laughs) But (laughs) But the kids really don't seem to mind it. How do you choose which books go onto Peggy's shelves on any given day. And does the stock vary depending on where you're going? Yes, it does vary depending on where we're going. You know, I operate on the premise that if someone is looking for a particular book, there's a very good chance that I will not have it unless it's like a big bestseller or something that that I can reasonably predict lots of people are looking for. So given that I can't have everything, I try to cater the inventory for like discovery. So I like to have lots of different sort of sub genres of fiction represented both in something that a person might be familiar with but haven't read, and also some newer things that if you liked this, you might like this. Mm. I also spend a lot of time digging through data over what we've sold and where we've sold it. So, for example, we go to a lot of farmer's markets during the summertime, and 
I've definitely found that certain things will sell more. We sell more literary fiction at farmer's markets, which I find kind of interesting. But I'd say about 75% of it stays the same each season. Mm -hmm. And then I do cater things to individual events. Every year we go to the Pride Festival in Nashville, and I fill out one bay full of LGBTQ books. Um, I do the same thing for schools. Like during our school visits, I actually get rid of about half of the adult inventory and bulk up all of the children's sections. And then I curate inventories for schools. So the librarians will send me lists or teachers will send me lists. Sometimes students will write recommendations and I'll order those books in. So fun. Yeah. And kids love that. So are there other kinds of events that you can think of uh, aside from farmer's markets that you'll tend to prioritize? Yeah. So we go to a lot of festivals. This year, I think we're adding, I think maybe the American Kennel Society, or I don't remember their names, but it's like a dog adoption day at Centennial Park in downtown Nashville. I'm very, very excited for that. I plan to bring my dog if I can. Yeah, <laughs> yes, of course. Books and pets. It's such a natural matchup. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. And let's see, we recently partnered with a bakery that wanted to raise money for an organization in Texas that offers legal services to refugees. And so we partnered with them on that and parked outside the bakery and sold books. We did a kid's birthday party. You know, the people come to the store all the time and they wanted to, oh, you know, instead of everyone to buy books. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We just parked in their driveway. It was very strange, but it was awesome. And I got to eat some really good cupcakes. Cupcakes and a bookmobile. I mean, it's heaven, except I would not do cupcakes because I am a cake a full-on cake person. I feel that the proportions of a cupcake aren't quite right. Wait a minute. Yes. I just learned something the other day. One of my kids told me about a cupcake technique where you break off the bottom of the cupcake and smush it on the top and then eat <gasps> it like a sandwich. How have I never known this my whole life? That could revolutionize cupcakes for me. Yeah, it could. Have we talked in depth, as I think we must, on the podcast about cake and pets and how they factor into our bookstore bookmobile fantasies? I don't know if we have. So our fantasies, which we've actually spent a lot of time offline cultivating and adding to, they all involve a place where you can come and buy books, but also a place where we sell cake. And they also need to be a place where pets are welcome. Like it's very important to me to have cats at the bookstore and for you to bring Clementine, your dog, to the bookstore. So you came up with a brilliant tagline for this fantasy bookstore. Can you share it with everybody? Okay. It's, we have books on cake, but please don't get cake on our books. <laughs> Which is genius. I want to say I love the idea of Clementine, who's just like the most social dog on the planet. I love the idea of her either in a bookstore or on a bookmobile. Clementine belongs on the bookmobile, clearly. <laughs> anyway, also clearly Julie and I could continue talking about this for a really long time, but we'll stop here. We did talk to Kevin about more practical matters. What would you say you like the most about captaining a bookmobile and the least? I guess when I'm on the bookmobile and a person gets on the bookmobile, very frequently it's their first time on any bookmobile and people just kind of want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I'm a very gregarious person and having just random conversations with strangers is very satisfying to me and I love it. The thing I like least about the, <laughs> the bookmobile <laughs> is the challenge of keeping it operating and feeling like I'm constantly, like I don't know why things are happening. Like after two years, I feel like I've gained a little bit of knowledge about like diesel engines, oh, and, okay. <laughs> you know, and like maintenance and that sort of thing. But it often feels like whack-a-mole, but I don't know which one I'm supposed to be hitting. You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> 
that could be just associated with our bookmobile in particular. But um, last fall, we were on our way to an event in Murfreesboro, Tennessee, which is just south of here. And it was the state school and public librarian conference. So I was like, I was really excited. I was going to see my librarian friends, you know, spend a day down there. And um, the bookmobile started smoking a little bit. And I'm oh going like probably 60, <laughs> 60 miles an hour down the interstate. And then there was a loud pop and an incredible amount of smoke started coming out of the front. I don't know anything about cars, but that That's sounds bad. bad. <laughs> we know yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. And I lost uh, the steering column. Like it was very hard to oh. steer. And because the, the bookmobile is so heavy, I had to like stand up and put all of my weight <gasps> into like even being able to merge onto the side of the road, oh, no. that makes me like never want. Right, <laughs> like I was, I was triggered for like the next month. Anytime I got on there, I was like checking everything and like driving really slowly and like. Peggy is delicate. Peggy is delicate. That's right. Not that that's happening all the time, but when it does happen, it's very frustrating and life threatening. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which well, is and, <clears throat> frustrating. <laughs> yes, and to be honest, the interstate that runs next to the bookstore that I have to take to get basically anywhere that's further than fifteen minutes away is under construction, so the lanes are very narrow oh, and there's no. concrete wall, like <gasps> barriers on both sides. Oh no! And the bookmobile fills up the lane. Oh yeah. no! So no margin for error. Exactly. Ah, uh, that is really stressful. I, I feel stressed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to do that to you. <laughs> That's okay. You mentioned that you're spearheading a new nonprofit program for Parnassus. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, I'm really, really excited about this. I'm glad you all asked. When I came on to Parnassus, they wanted to expand the work that the Bookmobile was doing with schools. So one of the things that I tried to do was take the Bookmobile to a wider, a greater diversity of schools. Generally speaking, most of the schools that we go to have affluent student populations. We tried to go to several like Title I schools. And while it was really fun for kids to come see the bookmobile, there's also like a little sadness to the fact that a lot of kids would come on and like not a lot of kids were able to buy a book. Yeah. And last winter, like January, February, I approached Karen and Anne and asked to have some time set aside so that I could try to hammer out what a community-oriented program might look like for us at the bookstore. Mm -hmm. They graciously allowed me to do that. Um, and what we came up with is a program that will sponsor a grade level at a time at a school. So every seventh grader in X middle school. And over the course of the school year, every kid in that grade level will get six new books. Four of the books will be chosen collaboratively with the school. And, you know, if we're able to manage it, have an author visit for one of those books. And two of the books, students will just get to choose themselves on the bookmobile. So I'll fully stock the bookmobile and kids can get on and get whatever book they want. What a day. What a day that will be. Yeah. Just after our interview with Kevin, we let the tape run and we chatted about what we were thinking. So here are our thoughts recorded immediately following that conversation. Well, I don't know about you, Julie. I just experienced a, a roller coaster of emotions because <laughs> <laughs> for the first half of the conversation, everything Kevin said made me think, yes, this is our <laughs> destiny. We can do this. It's so wonderful. And then it went up and smoke on the BQE. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> On yeah. the, in a pothole that throws the bookmobile to the side of the road against yes. a railing on the BQE. Yes, and the $750 festival <laughs> permits, and because you know New York City is going to have... I don't think we can do it in the city, is my guess. So that's what we thought then. What are we thinking now? I'm still on a bit of a roller coaster, right? We learned enough to know that running a bookmobile has its own challenges that overlap with bookstores, but are also unique to the bookmobile, like, you know, blowing up on the PQE, for example. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Just one <Right>. example. <laughs> but I am interested in exploring other ideas. You know, maybe we would run this as a nonprofit. The idea of having lots of interaction with schools, 
you know, we are children's book authors. Maybe there's a way for us to support or complement the work that the New York Public Library is already doing. I love that. And I mean, it's so fun. Really, the notion of owning something akin to an ice cream truck with Clementine, you know, her head out the window and kids running to see our pets and sharing the joy of the books with them. I mean, it's just hard to beat that. Yeah, it's pretty darn idyllic. So there are challenges, but this is a work in progress and we'll keep pondering. Exactly. So I think that's it for this episode of the Book Dreams podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like the podcast and think someone else would too, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. Be sure to let us know if there's a book-related topic you've wondered about, and we'll try looking into it in a future episode. You can reach us for that reason or any other at contact at bookdreamspodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at bookdreamspod and on Instagram at bookdreamspodcast. The New York Public Library posts their location on their Twitter feed every day at NYPL Bookmobile. You can find Parnassus Books online at ParnassusBooks.net and Peggy the Bookmobile on Twitter at Parnassus Truck. Many thanks to our associate producer, Gianfranco Lentini, and to our theme music composer, Maya Polsky. I just want to say, by the way, that Gianfranco has offered to drive our Bookmobile. Yes, that's right. (laughs) Thank God, because I don't know if you've ever seen me drive, but it's it's not good. (laughs) Oh, I'm the worst. I'm the worst. <laughs> anyway, uh, you can find Eve at eveyohallam.com and me at juliesternberg.com. And check out the podcast website, www.bookdreamspodcast.com. Until next time, happy book dreaming. Happy book dreaming. Love, come listen to Book Dreams with Julie and Eve.